Welcome, welcome, welcome to All About Hanukkah. And I want to just start today by saying that it's a very, very special time that begins on Sunday evening uh, when the Hanukkah first candle is lit. And so I just say thank you for being a part of all of this. So let me just begin here and I want to share my screen and I want to, here we go. I just going to get rid of this and here we go. So here is uh, Hanukkah. There's different forms of Hanukkah. Some are flat, some are like menorahs, some are very uh, decorative, some have uh, colored candles in them. Um, Others uh, use oil, <laughs> and here, this one has candles, as you can see. And uh, but it's a notice; it's a different than a normal menorah, which is a seven prong. This is nine, and there's a reason for it. Now, just quickly, I want to walk into you, walking you through, so you'll understand a little bit about what is happening and what the Jewish people celebrate around the world. Number one, we see that this is a picture of the feast. This is the basic seven feasts found in Leviticus. Uh, and uh, Hanukkah is not one of the seven feasts. And there are two outside feasts, one on uh, the, the fall season, going into winter, and then one in the spring. The one in the spring is the one with Esther and the one where uh, Haman, try to eradicate the whole Jewish people by having them killed, slain. Uh, the one we're looking at now is the eradication of the Jewish faith, which is Hanukkah under Antiochus. Some would say Antiochus. I'll call him Antiochus, which is, I think, the normal uh, pronunciation. Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And I'll explain more about his name in a moment as well. But it was an attempt to eradicate the Jewish faith. And if it would have been successful, there would have been no Jewish faith, there'd been no Jesus, there would have been no Christian faith. Uh, so it's really important that we understand that uh, how God was working. So all about Hanukkah uh, is uh, first question that people ask right away is, did Jesus observe Hanukkah? And the answer, of course, is yes, he did. And you say, where do you see that? Very interestingly, Hanukkah is not mentioned in any of the Jewish uh, literature in the Tanakh. In the, no, it's not in Tenora, T Torah. It's not in any of the other books. Uh, and uh, it is mentioned, of course, in the Talmud, but uh, not in the, uh, the Tanakh. But it is mentioned in the New Testament. And we see it in John 10, and we read about uh, in verse 22, it says, now it was the feast of dedication. Right away, the dedication, that, that's Hanukkah. That's what Hanukkah means, dedication. So feast of dedication, Hanukkah in Jerusalem. And, uh, and it was winter. So we know for sure that this wasn't referring to tabernacles. It was the winter, so that has to be Hanukkah. Hanukkah always uh, falls in the uh, month of Kislev, and that will always be in the, either November or December, late November, December. Sometimes it falls right about the time of uh, the Christian feast of Christmas, and uh, sometimes it's further away like it is this year, where it's almost a month away. And so it says, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And so we see that Jesus was there. Now, when we talk about Hanukkah, we see there is uh, nine branches on the Hanukkah. That's what it's called, a Hanukkah, the menorah that's used at this time. And you can also see that there is a middle one and eight prongs, the middle one is you'll see is called the shemesh or the guardian or the servant candle. I like the servant explanation the best. Um, and you'll see here, there's three uh, 
uh, symbols or three parts that they use uh, during this time in today's celebration. One is the dreidel, and it's a spinning top, and it, it's, uh, it has the letters on it, which spell out, and I'll show it in a moment, great miracle happened there. And so the kids love playing with this, and they uh, will use these little chocolate or candies or little chocolate coins, and I'll show those in a moment. And then they also have something called Sufganeo, which is uh, the jelly-filled donuts. Very high, rich in calories, 600 calories plus. Um, and, uh, they fill them sometimes whipped cream, cream cheese, but fill them with jelly and uh, very rich. And then they have the latke. Uh, just, I didn't show a picture of the latke here. It's a star of David. But the latke is a potato pancake fried in oil and to a place of crispiness. And you dip them into sour cream or uh, some kind of a, a, a something like that. So it's an interesting uh, uh, time of eating. No meat. It's all dairy. And so uh, let me just move on here to the next um, one. Here's a picture of the uh, menorah, the Hanukkah. And there are different ways of lighting the candle. Uh, I was reading just even this week, uh, three different traditions. Some have them all in and uh, at all times, other the candles, uh, depending on it, whether it's uh, lit with oil or whether you have a candle. Most have used candles, and <clears throat> and in this tradition here, you notice it says you the candles are attached from right to left. You can see the uh, the bottom right here. You you attach them from right to left, but you light them from left to right. Now that's a tradition. That's an Ashkenazi tradition, and not everybody follows that, depending on what your tradition is. Now one of the things that is very very important for the modern Jewish people, uh, for the children particularly, they have these, what they're called gelt, they're coins. And you can tell they're, you can see they're wrapped in uh, aluminum, uh, sometimes gold colored, sometimes silver colored. They normally have a, a Hanukkah on it and they're chocolate inside. What do they do with this? Well, they play games with the, the, uh, the chocolate coins and they do, they use the dreidel. <clears throat> the dreidel, is these spinning tops normally made of wood and it's uh they have letters on them and they have the nun going from right to left in, in the hebraic tra tradition gimel hey and shin and you say what does that mean well uh when you're playing this here's the how to play and how to read a dreidel you can see um the, the nun is a letter nun and it uh, begins a word uh, and ness, and you can see it's a miracle. Well, let me just go down nun, gimel, 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 hey, and shin. And, and they say that means that these words ness, gadol, haya, and sham, which means miracle great happened there in other words a great miracle happened there where well in israel where with the maccabees and and at the time which i'll explain in a moment and so when they spin these tops and they play uh they, it is the, the the nun if you, that comes up you do nothing and if uh, you the gimel comes up, you get the whole pot. So now they started out. Everybody puts one of these chocolate coins or chalk or a candy in the center, and you get it all if you get the if the gimel comes up. Whoever's spinning it, and if the hay, you take half, only half, and a shin, you add one. You have to give up one of yours. So they have a lot of fun playing these things. And you say, where did that ever begin? Well, like traditions, and I'll talk a little bit about traditions later, but traditions rise up over time. Most times we don't know where the traditions began. We know the period that began. We don't know why sometimes they began, but they did begin. Now, they, we understand that the using the dreidel was uh, during the time of uh, uh, in, um, the 
you say that it goes back to when the uh, uh, Antiochus the fourth put on the restrictions on the Jewish people and they would come in and raid them to make sure they weren't practicing any of their faith whatever and they had these dreidels and it was used later on always around the Hanukkah time the dreidels were used and the, when they're uh, ones who were in the shivas there there were the study the students studying for Torah and what happened when there would be uh, people would come in, the authorities would come in and they were not allowed to practice their faith. Uh, they would uh, have the scrolls out. They quickly put the scrolls away when they heard somebody come, pull out the dreidels and start playing dreidels. And the people, the soldiers would come in and say, what are you doing? What are you, are you studying? Are you reading? They say, no, we're playing. And, and it was a form of gambling, like with the chocolates, you know, and, the, and, and they, they'd walk away. So it became a covering. It became a a uh, secret way of studying uh, in, in case of somebody would interrupt and there might be a rest or whatever. So quite interesting, the dreidel has had a history to that uh, uh, um, extent. Now, I want to just take you through, and again, you know, the uh, whole thing with the not eating any meat here, and you're having the sufkania, you're having the lat latke, and they have other foods as well, but it is a time of of ex uh, excitement uh, and they also do something else they also share gifts i didn't put that on my screen but they share gifts with one another some people say where did the coming with the sharing of gifts have to do with uh hanukkah well again uh, like the tradition we don't know where it began some people would say it began in the third fourth uh, fifth century and that would be in response to the fact that when the Byzantine area took place and uh, Constantine came in and the church was established and the church as well of course celebrated Christmas giving of gifts and the many of the Jewish traditions of children would want to say how come we don't get gifts how come the uh, my friends who I are in the schools or whatever um, have gifts and they some believe that it began at that time that the giving of gifts on Hanukkah took place because as a reaction of what would happen in the Christian uh, realm and the Christian traditions. Uh, we don't know for sure. I'm just saying that again with traditions, uh, they rise up in their practice and even all the traditions around the Seder meal, but some of them we don't know where they came from, but we, they're there and they're entrenched. We have traditions around Christmas, we have traditions around uh, Easter and the Christian faith and as well. And some of those we don't know where they came. Now let me go through the history. Now, where does this all fit in? Where does Hanukkah fit in? This is probably one which I really want to emphasize because a lot of Christians, um, excuse me, a lot of Christians do not realize where it fits in. I mean, does it fit in the time of Moses? Does it fit in the time of Solomon? Does it fit in the time of the kings or when? Well, let me just walk you through just to place it so you understand. And uh, we, of course, we the history of David when he became a king, the, the kingdom was salt, consolidated. It was the strongest. Uh, he took the most territory under his reign. His son Solomon then to, became king. Solomon was known as the wisest man in the world. Solomon uh, kingdom uh, under him became the richest and uh, most peaceful as well. He was known for his wisdom. People came from all countries all around and he expanded in riches. Now, he was the one that built uh, the temple as well. And even though David wanted to, but he had blood on his hands, the scriptures say, and so it was given to Solomon and he built the temple. However, Solomon, uh, you know, he ended up uh, living his life. He had um, uh, uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines and uh, uh, and, and when he died, his, the kingdom was divided. And uh, he, uh, we see that to the north was uh, called Israel, to the south was called Judah, two kingdoms to the south, 10 to the north. Uh, and so the, to the south was Judah and Benjamin, and to the north, the other tribes. And of course, we see the history during the divided kingdom. So the priests, uh, sorry, um, the kings, the kings to the um, in the northern kingdom of Israel, most of them were wicked, uh, evil. 
some there were a couple of good ones but to the south most of them were good and there was a couple of evil when there was uh, judgments placed upon them and uh, as a result uh, God would warn them again and again to turn back to him and the first part of the judgment was sent the Assyrians attacked Israel that's the northern kingdom we see that period in, in uh, Chronicles and uh, Kings we can read about that but then uh, the, the Assyrians wanted to take the southern kingdom but in the time of Hezekiah Hezekiah reached out to the Lord he prayed he prayed uh, on his bed and uh, uh, an angel of death came and killed a hundred and eighty five thousand of the Sennacherib's troops and they went back to Assyria and left Judea, uh, Judea alone but however 130 years almost later um, the Babylonians attack Judea because they weren't listening they weren't listening to what God was saying they didn't learn the lessons and the temple was destroyed and much of Jerusalem was uh, destroyed but not all of it but then there was a 70 years of captivity um, the 70 years of captivity um, the, uh, they, they took the Jewish people out of Judea and took them into Babylon and kept them there for 70 years and then after 70 years um, we, we see that happened was the Medes and the Persians took over the whole area over the Babylonians during that period the Medes are the what we call the Kurds today and Kurds are in northern Iraq northern uh, Turkey and uh, they also in northern Syria and they linked up with the Persians the Persians are the Iranians today Persia ancient Persia is Iran and so um, but they took over and under uh, uh, um, we, we know that they uh, during that time uh, Cyrus the Jewish people came back and, and to uh, to Israel then the next ones the Greeks took over from uh, the the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks were under Alexander okay under Alexander time and under Alexander um, the, he went through the whole of the world pretty well within 10 years he had conquered the world he was the amazing uh, strategies uh, 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 had strategies wartime strategies he was a military man and young and he ambitious and uh, but his 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 uh, reign lasted only 10 years he was a womanizer we believe he died of syphilis and after 10 years but he conquered the whole world in a very short time based on that uh, he died and the whole of the empire was uh, divided into four four different ones who were generals under him and th there was four empires and those four empires are described in Daniel the book of Daniel chapter 8 and here you can see a picture of it that uh, shows uh, the description was a ram and that was Alexander the Great and then you can see that there was he talks about the four horns and <clears throat> uh, Lysimachus uh, one of the horns here Seleucus this other one Cassandra and Ptolemy and uh, there's one other horn I'll come back to that in a moment but those four horns uh, those are four of the kingdoms that came out of Alexander the Great and uh, Alexander the Great you know he promoted the language of Greek you know in throughout the whole empire and so it united everybody with a common language but here it is you can see that Seleucus, Seleucus is the one where Antiochus is going to take over you'll see that in a moment and but it was huge it was the largest you know here Turkey Syria Iraq Iran Afghanistan Pakistan up into the uh, the, the, the bit of the northern area here now the other one the large area strong one was Ptolemy that's Egypt you see how this involved in the story of the Maccabees as well the other two smaller ones was Lysimachus over here and Cassandra Cassandra went down into Greece okay so those are the empires that came out of for following 
Alexander. Now, where did the, this is where the Maccabean revolt. So you can see in history, when I just put this down, this is where this took place. The Maccabean revolt took place um, in 160, 175 to 164 BC, before Christ, okay? And that's when it took place, and I'll explain that in a moment. And following that, in 67 uh, before Christ, 670 BC, uh, the Romans came in, and they took over. And uh, from uh, and that was that this Maccabean revolt time was uh, probably only the one period where the uh, the Jews were completely free for for you know, centuries and centuries. And then Romans came in, took over, and uh, enslaved the Jewish people as well. So uh, let me go through and go back to here and you see the ram, you can see the, the, the four horns and you can see it in, in, in the book of Daniel, it talks about the little horn that grew out of the other horn, the big horn. And so this was Antiochus IV. Now his name was Antiochus Epiphanes and we know that he actually existed because there's coins that we have found with his image on it and uh, their statues were had been built. Now Antiochus was a cruel, wicked, and unstable man. And his, he named himself uh, Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the illustrious one, or God manifest, some would say. He wanted to be worshiped and he demanded worship. And uh, uh, now he called himself Epiphanes, but he was so cruel and so unstable that the Jewish people who he was enslaving, and you'll see how, how the damage he did to them, uh, he, they called him Epiphanes, uh, uh, and uh, instead of Epiphanes, Epimes, which means madman. That's how they referred to him. It was not into his face, of course, but in, uh, in behind the scenes. Now, here's, just walking through the history here, Antiochus uh, IV, he, D uh, deposes his brother's murder. See, Antiochus the one was the first. Antiochus the first, he took over one of the four kings uh, uh, from the Seleucid en Empire from uh, 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 Alexander, and however, uh, his he uh, he passed on the kingdom to his son, and it was uh, Antiochus's brother. That brother was murdered, and uh, uh, the one who took over uh, wanted to be king. Antiochus went in, and he deposed his brother in 175 BC. And so he becomes the king of that whole Seleucid em Empire in 175 BC. So that's 175 years before the birth of Christ, uh, approximately. And uh, now it's very interesting. I want you just to walk through this. You see how important this is. Some of the Jewish leaders, when Antiochus IV became the king, um, wanted to, made a covenant. They went from Israel up into where Antiochus lived in Syria, and they uh, made a covenant. They wanted the Greek culture to come in. They this is where the gymnasiums, et cetera, were. These gymnasiums were places where, yes, they did uh, workouts and exercise, but they were also a place where there was all kinds of adultery going on, sexual activity going on, prostitutes were there. Uh, it was a place where people often would work out naked, and then there was uh, all kinds of uh, things happening contrary to uh, the Torah. But the Jewish leaders, it's very interesting. They wanted to the, 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 see the benefits of the, the Greek culture. They wanted the stuff that the, some of the things that the Greek people were being involved in, uh, the, especially the sexual activity and, and some of the other activities. And so they made a covenant. These were the leaders. Now, these leaders came back, and these leaders actually, uh, when they brought back the word that, you know, they had made a covenant with Antiochus IV. Uh, they uh, split the kingdom. And you'll see in a moment that that was, uh, caused a lot of problems and for them. Now, 
Antiochus uh, went down to in 170 BC to Egypt. Remember Egypt to the south of, uh, of Israel, and he went there because Ptolemy was uh, who was in charge of Egypt, the whole Egyptian area there, was ex wanting to expand his territory, and Antiochus was not one willing to allow him to do that. So he went in and he attacked. Now he invades and he defeats Ptolemy, and he, but he spared his life. He spared his life. And he came back, and while he came back, um, he comes and he comes to the uh, Israel. And he actually, because of the split that was taking place, a lot of the conservative Jews that were saying no to the covenant that had made, the, the, part, the agreement that had made, they said, no, we don't want to take part of it. And so he was angry. And so he actually plunders the sanctuary. And we actually read about that. Uh, I'm just going to read from the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees, 1st Maccabees, covers the whole 15-year uh, period that is involved with the Hanukkah, etc. So let me just read. I'm just reading from uh, of the book of Maccabees here. And it says, um, after subduing Egypt, Antiochus returned in the 143rd year, that's 169 BC, he went up against Israel, came to Jerusalem with a strong force. He arrogantly entered the sanctuary, took the golden altar, the lampstand for the light, and all its utensils. He took also the table of the bread of presence, the cups for a drink offering, the bowls, the golden censer, the curtains, the crown, the gold decorations in front of the temple. He stripped it all off. He took the silver and the gold, the costly vessels, he took also the hidden treasures which he found. Taking them all, he departed to his own land. So again, he stripped the temple at that time. <clears throat> However, we see a year later, Antiochus go back and uh, Ptolemy was now was uh, wanting to expand again. Remember, he, he was defeated the first time, but he wasn't killed. He now linked up with uh, another partner and he was also wanting to uh, work uh, uh, together with what would become Rome in that area. And uh, Antiochus went down there to stop him and attack again. However, Antiochus IV was stopped by the Roman ambassador uh, who was linked up with Ptolemy. Now, Antiochus was furious and he lost that battle. And on his way back through Israel, Antiochus through Apollonius, you remember that name, Apollonius, he makes a covenant. Now this time is a, the other one was a more of an agreement. This was a covenant of peace. And uh, he deceived the Jews into the, the peaceful intents. And we actually read that when he breaks the covenant, let me just read again from 1 Maccabees. It says, two years later, the king uh, sent to the cities of Judah, a chief collector of tribute. And he came to Jerusalem with a large force. Deceitfully, he spoke peaceable words to them, and they believed him. And he suddenly fell upon the city, dealt it a severe blow, destroyed many people of Israel. He plundered the city, burnt it with fire, tore down its houses and its surrounding walls. They took captive the women and children, seized the cattle. Then they fortified the city of David with a strong wall and strong towers, and became their citadel. And they stationed their sinful people, lawless men. They strengthened their position. They stored up arms and food, collecting the spoils of Jerusalem. They stored them there and became a snare. Now notice they became a snare. Okay, so again, the covenant was made. Remember this because we're going to see this coming in, you know, when uh, in Daniel talks about uh, the uh, Antichrist when he comes. And, and, and Tiffany, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Antiochus Epiphanes IV was the beginning of a prophecy that was partially completed. We're going to see the fulfillment of that same prophecy from Daniel. And Daniel wrote this 400 years before the time of Antiochus. He wrote all about this uh, Alexander coming through, the, the conquering. You see references to uh, this person uh, who is Antiochus 
who does this in, in breaking a covenant. But we also see the fulfillment in the time of the tribulation period where there's going to be uh, Antichrist will rise up, make a covenant of peace, and then break it in the middle of the covenant, in the middle of that seven-year period, and uh, etc. So we see the, all of these being laid out ahead of time. Now, the final thing that happened was, um, uh, we, we read this, um, <clears throat> oh, let me, uh, before I do that, one other thing that uh, uh, Antiochus did is that uh, he said that at this time, uh, he wrote that the whole kingdom should be one people, and each should give up his customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. So all the Gentiles, non-Jews, all of them nations, they accepted what he had commanded. Many from Israel gladly adopted their religion. Again, we see the compromise here. Now, this is a pattern that we're going to have to watch because we're in that same pattern right now, the compromising of religion with the state when they are saying, you will become like us. They sacrificed, and, and, and look what they had to do. Even the Jewish people, they sacrificed to idols, profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow the customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary. So they're no longer able to do that in, this, in the temple, to profane Sabbaths and feasts to defile the sanctuary and the feast, priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for altars, or for idols all around, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised, so they weren't allowed to do any more circumcision, and they were to make themselves abominable by every unclean and profane thing, so that they should forget the law, change all the ordinances, and whoever does not obey the command of the king will die. Wow. And then it goes on saying, such words he wrote to his whole kingdom. He appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the cities of Judah to offer sacrifice city by city. Many of the people, everyone uh, of the, who forsook the law, joined them and they did evil in the land. They drove Israel into hiding in every place of refuge they had. So basically we see what happened is that uh, m many of the Jews conformed, not all, but the ones who didn't were being forced into hiding. And now the final act, after he did all of those things, we read that he took on the 15th of Kislev, uh, which is uh, 167 BC, he put the idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. And that was an abomination to the Jews. He built altars in the cities and they were burned incenses in the streets and in the houses to the gods, not to, uh, not to Yahweh, not to the Lord, but to uh, the many multi-gods in the Greek culture. They tore and burnt all the Torah scrolls. They put them in the city streets, tore them apart, had bonfires. And if you had a, caught with a Torah scroll of any kind in your house, death penalty. They incited violence in the cities. Interesting. If you notice what happened in, in the, even in the States in the last few years, the inciting of violence in the cities, that was promoted in this time as well to cause uh, the disruption in the cities and to bring it into subjection, to bring it into even poverty. And then he did the ultimate thing the abomination of all things, and it talks about the desolation of abomination. Daniel talks about it, and we see it again uh, coming up. And Jesus talked about this. That's going to be coming up in the end times. And it was a sacrifice of the pig on the altar on Kislev 25. Kislev 25, remember that date? Because that's, that's when Hanukkah each year is celebrated. And you'll see how that works. Now, the other thing they did was... Uh, if you, they found your church, your child sac circumcised, the mothers and the family be put to death. Not only that, but they took the circumcised baby, hung it on their mother's neck, and killed them in the public square. They, uh, 
uh, in front of everyone. Total and brutal. Uh, death to those who would not eat unclean food. If you wouldn't eat the, uh, all the unclean foods that were um, the Greeks did eat, uh, the Jewish people would be de killed. Death was the punishment. So then we hear at that point, that's where the Maccabees come in. The Maccabees revolted. And they finally did defeat Antiochus three years later in 164 BC. It took just over three, just over three years to defeat them. And they defeated them in uh, 164. Now, I'm going to just put these up. If you have a pen or pencil, uh, paper, you may want to write these down. But Daniel 12, verse 9 and 10. Daniel 7, verse 6 and verse 25. Daniel 8, verse 8 to 13, describes how all of this fits together from the point of, of uh, Alexander, Antiochus, and the desecration, and, and even uh, the, the purification. And so you're going to uh, see this in those, uh, you can read Daniel 7 and 8, you can read all of Daniel, but 7 and 8, uh, those verses, and Daniel 12. So I just, you can... Uh, just copy them down very quickly if you have a pen and uh, just take a look at them. Now, by the way, in the New Testament, we actually see uh, this referred to in, in Matthew 24. And uh, Jesus was saying, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. Now, this is, you know, remember, Jesus is talking about the end times. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken, of, oops, go back to there, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever hears, let him understand. So there is coming a time when there's going to be abomination of desolation, just like it took place in the time of Antiochus. And that is to come. You can see the connections there. And now in 2 Thessalonians 2, we read this amazing passage. And it says, let no one deceive you by any means. And in talking about the day of the Lord, this is talking about the end time. This is talking about just before the return of, of Jesus. For the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So again, the, the, the the falling away of the believers, of the ones who are followers, they will. There's a falling away will take place, the apostasy, if you will. And then it says, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes, exalts himself above all. That is called God, or that is worship. So he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. And then in the last part, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so that's what the Antichrist will be doing in the coming times, the time to come. But that's what Antiochus did as well. He did that in the, as it was the first part, the partial fulfillment of that prophecy, and then the fullness of the prophecy being fulfilled. So let me go through the Maccabees very quickly. And... I'm going to walk through the, uh, the, the, I just want you to just, some of the amazing things. So here, here's what happened. Mattathias, or Mattathias, he was the father. And when he heard about the, uh, the desolation uh, that took place, the desecration, I should say, the desecration that took place with the pig on the altar of, uh, 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 uh offering, um, when he found that out, he was so angry. And he said, and this is recorded in 1 Maccabees, and uh, he says, alas, why was I born to see this? The ruin of my people, the ruin of the holy city, to dwell there when it was given over to the enemy, the sanctuary given over to aliens. Why should we live in any longer? And Mattathias and his sons rent their clothes, and they put on sackcloth, and they mourn greatly. Now, Mattathias was asked in, at this time because uh, Antiochus sent a, a representative to, uh, right into Israel. He recognized that Mattathias, who at this time was now hiding in the hills, and uh, he was uh, recognized that he actually was in uh, the area of Moadim, just about half an hour from Tel Aviv, 
and uh, in today's map, and uh, he went recognize him, and he was asking him to help lead the Jews into apostasy. Now, Mattathias sure, uh, was still living in Moadim at this time, but uh, not he was not practicing at all what they were being forced to do. But Antiochus sent his soldier, his representative, to go there and convince Mattathias to lead the others who were uh, dissenters from what was being asked. And Mattathias answered when the, the agent came, the king's agent came, and he said in a loud voice, even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him, and have chosen to do his commandments, departing each one from the religion of his father, yet I and my sons and my brothers will live by the covenant of our fathers. He made a decision. We're not going to do that. We're going to live by the word of God. And then he goes on to say, far be it for us to desert the law and ordinances. We will not obey the king's word by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. And so at that time, um, one of the other leaders of the Jews heard Mattathias and he went up to the altar that had been built there. And uh, they were the, the agent of the king wanted to do a sacrifice uh, to the gods uh, to consolidate this agreement. And Mattathias says, of course, says no. Another Jew, though, went up and offered a sacrifice, a pagan sacrifice, on this altar that had been temporarily built for the purpose of the agreement. And Mattathias was so angry, he killed the uh, Jew that offered the sacrifice. He killed the king's agent. And then they, uh, he had to run and hide. And then Mattathias cried out in the city, Modadimu, uh, with a loud voice saying, let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. And he and his sons fled to the hills and left all that they had in the city. So they left the city, went into the hills, and Mattathias then hears about, uh, and I'm really summarizing a lot of this now, uh, Mattathias hears about fellow Jews. They were also went uh, into the hills, they were hiding, and the, the forces of Antiochus were seeking out the ones living in the hills, and they went to, and they found a group that was allied in, in alliance with Mattathias, and they found him, but the Jew, this Jewish group were very observant, and they said, we will not fight on the Shabbat. And the forces came in and slew all of them, 1,000 people who wouldn't fight on the Shabbat, kill the whole community that was in the hills. When Mattathias heard about this, and uh, he was just grieved, they went into mourning. When Mattathias and his friends learned about it, they mourned deeply, and each said to his neighbor, if we can do all as our brethren have done and refuse to fight for the Gentiles for our lives and for our ordinances, they will quickly destroy us from the earth. So they made this covenant that day. Let us fight uh, against every man who comes to attack us on the Sabbath day. Let us not all die as our brother died in the hiding places. So Mattathias made a a decision. He says, we know it's a uh, the Sabbath is to be observed, but in this case, we're going to uh, not uh, keep the Sabbath if we're being attacked. We need to survive. And Mattathias then becomes the enforcer of the Torah. He actually goes forth and um, he, uh, uh, he enforces it. And let me just uh, see if I can find the enforcement. Yes. And this is what Mattathias does. He says, they organized an army. I'm reading from First Maccabees here. They organized an army, struck down sinners in the, their anger and lawless men in their wrath. The survivors fled to the Gentiles for, safe, for safety. And Mattathias and his friends went about and tore down altars. They forcibly circumcised all the uncircumcised Jewish boys. And they found within the borders that they found within the borders of Israel. They hunted down the arrogant men and the work prospered in their hands. They rescued the law, the, the, law, the Torah, out of the hands of the Gentiles and kings. And they never let sinners gain the upper hand. So he, he, from the hills, they enforced uh, 
wherever they could, the Torah would be observed. Now, time came in 166 BC, Mattathias is on his deathbed. He speaks to his sons. Now the days drew near for Mattathias to, uh, to die. And he said to his sons, arrogance and reproach have now come become strong. It is a time of ruin and furious anger. Now my children show zeal for the law, that's Torah, and give your lives for the covenant of our fathers. Remember the deeds of the father, which we did in the generations and received great honor and everlasting name. Was not Abraham found faithful and tested and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? Joseph in the time of his distress kept the commandment and became Lord of Egypt. Phineas, our father, one of the priests, became uh, because he was deeply zealous, received the covenant of everlasting priesthood. Joshua, because he fulfilled the command becoming a judge in Israel. Caleb, because he testified in the assembly, received an inheritance in the land. David, because he was merciful, inherited the throne of kingdom forever. Elijah, because of great zeal for the law, was taken up into heaven. Hananiah, Azariah, Azariah and Mishael, that's um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who most of us would know, believed and were saved from the flames, the fire. Daniel, because of his innocence, was delivered from the mouth of lions. And so observed from generation to generation that none who put their trust in him will lack strength. Do not fear the words of the sinners, for his splendor will turn into dung and worms. Today he will be exalted, but tomorrow he will not be found, because he has returned to the dust and his plans perish. My children, be courageous, grow strong in the law, for by it you will gain honor. Wow, what an amazing speech. Now he died and it was passed over to his son Judas. Judas wasn't the oldest, Judas was the strongest. He was the most military, most capable, and he was nicknamed the hammer. Judas was called the hammer. And now the, for immediately Apollonius, remember that he was the one that made a covenant when the uh, false covenant came in, coming back from Egypt. Apollonius was sent by Antiochus to uh, and gathered an army from Samaria, which was just to the north where, of Israel. And uh, uh, he, he brought this army to come against Judas and his men. And But uh, Judas, again, even though they were outnumbered, they were defeated. And Apollonius, Apollonius had a huge sword. He was known for the size of the sword he had. And uh, of course, the men of Judah, Maccabees, they had nothing uh, in the area of weaponry, armor, or anything like that. He took the sword and he kept that sword in the battles, all the battles he was going to be facing. After that battle of Apollonius, Saron, uh, under the command of, of uh, the Syrian army, uh, under Antiochus's order, he gathered a group and uh, he attacked at, and gathered at Beth Horon and came against Judas and again, uh, uh, Judas Maccabeus, he addresses his men. He knows he's outnumbered. He knows he's greatly outnumbered. And he, he says to his men, it is not the size of the army that victory in battle depends, but strength comes from heaven. Wow, isn't that an amazing statement? You can see he's depending on the Lord. They come against us in great pride and lawlessness to destroy us and our wives and our children and to spoil us. But we fight for our lives and our laws, referring to the Torah. He himself, talking about God, will crush them before us. As for you, do not be afraid of them. Wow, what an amazing, amazing. And so um, he crushed uh, Saron uh, in this battle. 800 of them were killed, and the army of Saron, they fled to Gaza. And it says that the terror filled the army of Saron. And then it says the terror filled the land whenever they heard the name of Judah. This is the, the enemies of, of the Jewish people. The terror filled the land because of what God had done. Now, Antiochus was not going to let this happen, so he gathers a huge army. Now, I'm talking huge army. And he paid them a year in advance, which was an amazing um, uh, attempt. And uh, 
but it brought a lot of problems for him because he ran out of money. He paid a year in advance. He was going to send this army and to wipe out uh, the Maccabees and all the people that were with him. And uh, But he ran out of money. So what he had to do is he had to uh, divide his army up into two. One half was going to go to Persia with him, that's Iran, and gather money, do some, uh, get, uh, get some resources, uh, pl plummet some of the resources from the Persians. And, and but he, so he did that himself, but he sent the other, Lysias was given the other half of the army to attack Judas. Now, he was commanded to destroy Israel. He was actually given elephants. Now, elephants were fearful in the time of a battle because especially against uh, infantry, you just go in there and the elephants with their hugeness would just stir up and just knock down. They were terrifying as, as, as uh, weapons of war and gave you a huge advantage. And uh, he also chose to lead with him Ptolemy. That's not the one from Egypt, the Ptolemy, another one. Uh, and Nicanor and Gorgias, and he had 40,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry. Now that's a lot of men. You're going to see in a moment. Uh, Lysias goes to the plain of Emmaus. Remember Emmaus? Emmaus is just outside of Israel. That's where Jesus uh, talked to the two men on the road to Emmaus, you know, in, a, in John, the Gospel of John. And Judas and his men prepare for battle. Now they gathered at Mitzpah. Mitzpah was, remember, Mitzpah is a place of prayer. It was a covenant was made. Remember when uh, Jacob left uh, from Laban and he uh, took uh, you know, Rachel and Leah and uh, uh, Laban came and wanted to, uh, uh, he was angry and they, but they met, they made a covenant, they prayed. And um, so Mitzpah was a time of, there's an altar there. So, uh, Judas Maccabee goes there to pray, to fast, to repent. And it says, so they assembled near and went to Mitzvah, opposite Jerusalem, because Israel formerly had a prayer, a place of prayer in Mitzvah. They fasted that day, put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on their heads and rent their clothes. And they opened the book of the law to inquire the, these matters about which the Gentiles were consulting the images of their idols. They also brought the garments of the priesthood and their first fruits and the tithes, and they stirred up the Nazarites who had completed their days. So again, he's now in prayer. And here's Judas, what he cries out. How will we be able to withstand them if thou, referring to the Lord, dost not help us? So he knew that he had to have depend on the Lord. Then, look at what they did next. I love their tactic here. It's not a military tactic. It was one from the Lord. Then they sounded the trumpets and gave a loud shout. Where do you remember the trumpets, a loud shout? Uh, maybe with Gideon. <laughs> How about with uh, um, uh, the time of um, uh, when they sent out the uh, Jehoshaphat? Uh, but anyway, after this, Judas appointed leaders of the people in charge of thousands, hundreds, and fifties, and tens. And he said to those who were building houses, or were betrothed, or who were planting vineyards, or who were faint-hearted, that they should return home according to the law. So he made said, look, if you know if you're going to be getting married, if you're betrothed, you want to honor the laws that are on that. If you're in the middle of planting a vineyard, if you're afraid as well, then you can go. But then the army. The rest of them marched out and encamped in the south of Emmaus. And Judah said, Gird yourselves up and be valiant. Be ready early in the morning to fight these Gentiles who have assembled against us to destroy us and our sanctuary. It is better for us to die in battle than to see the misfortunes of our nation and of our sanctuary. But as his will in heaven may be, so he will do. Again, the amazing uh dependence on the lord now gorgias leads 5000 infantry and 1000 selected cavalry to attack judas by night now, this is what happened and they were gathered and uh in in, in emmaus but uh they, they gorgias was sent by lysias out to uh, do a night attack before uh the battle could take place 
and he took 5,000 of the entry of uh, the, you know, the huge number they already had, 1,000, in a, a, a small sneak attack uh, to take Judas by uh, surprise at night. But, but God alerted Judas of that, the coming, and he moved camp. And then Judas comes actually to Emmaus, but Judas only has 3,000 men altogether. Now, just look at the numbers. You're going to see he had little armor and uh, very few swords, and he was going against an infantry of 35,000 men at Emmaus. Remember, 5,000 was left by Gorgias and 1,000 of the cavalry. But in the camp, in Emmaus, uh, we have uh, Lysias with 35,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and Judas only has 3,000 men without armor. And it says at daybreak, Judas appeared in the plain with 3,000 men, but they did not have armor and swords such as they desired. And they saw the camp of the Gentiles strong and fortified with cavalry around about it. And these men were trained in war. But Judas said to the men who were with him, do not fear their numbers or be afraid when they charge. Remember how our fathers were saved at the Red Sea when Pharaoh and his forces pursued them. And now let us go cry to heaven to see whether he will favor us and remember his covenant with our fathers and crush this army before us today. Then all the Gentiles will know that there is one who redeems and saves Israel. Oh, wow, wow, we wow. What an amazing statement and trust in the Lord. And at that time, the Judas attacks. And how does he attack? Shofars and boldness. Not very many weapons at all against Calvary, against uh, 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 a military trained men. And they kill 3,000 and all the rest fear. Again, terror and confusion went into the camp and they, they, they flew, they, they fled. And then, of course, Gorgias, who was put on the night attack, he couldn't find Maccabeus, he Judas, he couldn't find them. And so he came back to Emmaus. And when he returns to Emmaus, you know, and he is, sees what's happening. He is terrified as well, and he flees to Gaza. And so as a result, Lysias returns the following year. Now, they, they had one year of reprieve, and everybody had heard about Judas Maccabeus. He heard about his fame and victory, but Lysias returns the following year. Now, this time, he is given 60,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry, and, uh, and cavalry, and he comes to Beth Zur. Now, Judas, by this time, has grown from, remember, 3,000, he's grown to 10,000 men, and but he's going against 60,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. And so, again, look at what he says. Blessed art thou, O Savior of Israel, who didst crush the attack of the mighty warrior by the hand of thy servant David, and didst give the camp of the Philistines into the hands of Jonathan, the son of Saul, and of the man who cried, carried his armor. And so do thou him in this army by the hand of thy people Israel, and let them be ashamed of their troops and their cavalry, and fill them with cowardice. He's talking a prayer to fill the enemy with cowardice. Melt the boldness of their strength. Let them tremble in their destruction. Strike down them with the sword of those who love thee, and let all who know thy name praise thee with hymns. Wow, amazing, amazing. What happens? Judas wins a great battle, a great victory. 5,000 of the enemy were killed. They retreated back to uh, the north into the area of Syria and beyond, and, uh, and, and, and they were just it says in the book of Maccabees, they were so afraid of the courage of Judas's men that they were willing to give their life. Death was not even a consideration. Their courage was unbelievable. They had never seen that. Of course, these are mercenaries that are attacking, but they had never seen anything like this. So what happens was there's a total cleansing of the temple. And we read about that in 1 Maccabees 4. And I just want to read 
um, here, just before I go on to that, 1 Maccabees 4, um, we read, if I can just quickly find it for you, um, what they did. And he, he just, uh, I, I love this, and I just want to read it out for you. He says, he chose blameless priests devoted to the law. They cleanse the sanctuary, remove the defiled stones to an unclean place. They deliberated what to do about the altar or burnt offering that had been profaned. And so they thought it best to tear down the altar that had been defiled, lest it be a reproach on them, for the Gentiles had defiled it. So they tore down the altar. They stored the stones in a convenient place in the temple hill until they should become a prophet to tell them what to do with them. They took unhewn stones, as the law directs, built a new altar like the former one. They also rebuilt the sanctuary, the interior of the temple, consecrated the courts, made new holy vessels, brought the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the table into the temple. They burned incense on the altar, lighted the lamps of the lampstand, and they gave light in the temple. They, re they placed the bread on the table, hung up the curtains, and thus they finished all the work God had made had undertaken. And then it goes on to say, the next part was uh, on Keslev 25. What they did was um, they dedicated the temple to the Lord. They offered the sacrifice as the Torah directed on a new altar. They dedicated it with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. People fell on their face and worshiped. They celebrated for eight days, it says and restored and redecorated the front of the temple, the gates, the doors, and uh, etc. And so it says in uh, 1 Maccabees 4, it says, Then Judas and his brothers, whoops, a daisy, what happened there? Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of, the, of Israel determined that every year on the season of days and the dedication of the altar should be observed with gladness and joy for eight days beginning with the 25th day of the month of Kislev. Praise the Lord. Now, let me just take a moment and end this with something that is maybe you may not like, you may not want me to be talking about this, but the miracle of the oil. Now notice when we were reading that, they uh, when they built the altar and they, they dedicated, it was for eight days and we, we read that um, the, the miracle of the oil, um, you, and here the, the miracle that we, today, in the synagogues, in the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people around the world will have, you know, the Hanukkah, and they will talk about the great miracle that took place. They only had, apparently, according to the story, uh, one enough for one day of the oil, and uh, so they, had to go and get oil from the Galilee to uh, and, and bless it and consecrate it because all the other had been desecrated, only one. And that one day oil lasted for eight days until they could get back with uh, oil that was from the Galilee, which could be consecrated. And the miracle was that, and, and people remember even now, this day in our traditions and in, in the Jewish tradition, that the miracle that took place was the eight days of one day's supply of oil. However, in the book of Maccabees, chapter in verse Maccabees, the second minute, nothing is said about the miracle of the oil. Nothing. Um, it is recorded, though, in the uh, uh, Megillah Tanit, which is a scroll of fasting, which is uh, in the uh, uh, Gemara. The Gemara is a part of, you know, the, in the Talmud is the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Gemara is an exposition by the rabbis of the Torah. The Mishnah is the oral traditions, the oral teachings, the oral thing, uh, stories, etc., passed down. And, and then it was in the Talmud, but that Talmud was put together in 400 to 600 A.D., way, 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 way after the time we're talking about here. And the Maccabean priesthood had become very, very corrupt. Now, let me just say, um, there's basically the whole area with the 
um, the oil. Um, you, people ask, why, why are you saying it's a legend? Because it, number one, I would say, because it's not found anywhere in any of the literature, in anything in, written by the Maccabees, anything at all, until it's found in the Talmud hundreds of years, hundreds of years later. And what has happened is, this is probably one of the things that uh, may be a result, was that, remember, they, when the uh, Maccabees, they were priests, and they had taken over, Judas Maccabees, and the, and the priests that were assigned, they, they put the Torah back in, the temple back in, restored, rededicated, and uh, they were pure. But, you know, in, it only takes two generations, they say, maybe three generations for churches, denominations, groups to go from pure into breaking and corrupting and breaking down. That's, we, we know that from our own Christian traditions as well. But anyway, we read that the Maccabean priesthood became corrupt within, uh, within the next uh, 100 years, actually less than that. And what happened there was a new order rose up to keep the purity of the, the Maccabees. And they were called the Pharisees. But notice, by the time of Jesus, another 100 years or so, less than 100 years, the Pharisees had also become corrupt. But the Pharisees were purists when they began. They hated to see what the Maccabees, they saw the corruptness. And so it is postulated that this uh, story about the miracle of the oil was created by the Pharisees, which was in, in the, the Megillot. And it was to, because they wanted something that would do away with and obliterate the Maccabean priesthood, which became corrupt. And they were talking about being the new uh, upholders of Torah. And so the Pharisees, though, of course, they erased, they wanted to erase the corruption of the Maccabees, but of course they became corrupt themselves. I don't know if that's so, but I'm just saying, here's another one. Here's second Maccabees 10. I want to end off on this. But now the same day, this is talking about why they had eight days, according to the book of Maccabees. This is second Maccabees. It says, now upon the same day, the temple had been polluted by the strangers. And on the same day, it was cleansed again to wit on the the five and 20th day of the month of Kislev. So that's 25 Kislev. And they kept uh, the eight days. Notice this. They, uh, they kept eight days with joy after the manner of the Feast of the Tabernacles. Remembering that not before uh, they had kept the Feast of the Tabernacles when they were in the mountains and in the dens and like wild beasts. Therefore, they now carried boughs and green branches and, and palms for him that had given them good success in cleansing the temple. Now remember that those branches, that, that's the lulav. That's what we sell really in tab tabernacles. Remember they couldn't celebrate tabernacles because they were fighting. But now when they cleanse the temple, they're going to celebrate tabernacles. That's what this is saying. And they ordained by a common statute and decree that all the nations of Israel should keep these days every year. So that's how we come to this whole area of uh, the Maccabees. Now, let me just um, come back to you for a moment and say, I know that this sounds like horrendous. You may say, wow, what, is, what are you really saying? Well, I, I want to just go back and say, I don't know if the miracle of the oil is true or not. I don't think it is personally, because of all, it just is never mentioned at all until much, much later and became something to remember and replace. My concern is this, many of the Jewish synagogues, and I've been to different of the Hanukkah services, very few of them ever mention the miracles that God did through the Maccabees to the rededication of the temple. Almost all of them, and many Christian teachers as well, talk about the miracle of the oil. And I just think that is wrong emphasis because the miracle was God working through people who would take a stand for him, take a stand for Torah,
take a stand for his commandments, take a stand for being obedient. That is the miracle that, and I believe that miracle is going to be reenacted in the time to come where Christians are going to have to take a stand and know what they believe and know what they stand for. And the miracle will be that God will work through us and bring forth his purposes, but we're going to have to stand for our Bible. We're going to have to stand for his commandments. We're going to have to stand for Jesus. And uh, so for me, that's very, very important. However, I understand people love that story. They love to talk about the light and they talk about the light of Yeshua, the light of Jesus. And they talk about the light the, the, of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And I understand that. And I understand, by the way, like I look at a tradition like Christmas, <laughs> birth of Jesus. Look what we've done with tradition. What is most people today, if you ask them about uh, what what is Christmas about? They don't talk about Jesus. They'll talk about what? They'll talk about um, uh, uh, so many other other traditions that have been built up around Christmas. Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, Santa Claus, um, all kinds of things. Same as Easter, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. What people remember. Easter bunnies, chocolate, eggs, and, you know, egg hunts, and all those kind of things. And so traditions take over from what is real and very important. I just bring that before you. Uh, I, but I just want to end off with one last thing, and I know the time is going very quickly here. Well, it's gone. But I just wanted to end off with a four, maybe four lessons, okay? Here are four lessons, I believe that perhaps, or five lessons maybe. Here it is, and just really quickly and I close. Apostasy occurs first. You're going to see that in all these things with regard that I'm talking about, um, apostasy, the falling away of the church of believers always occurs first. Just like the Jewish people in the time of Maccabees, um, they fell away from their faith, they wanted the worldly, influence and there's a falling away of the faith and i look at the church today and i do see a, ra a rise in prayer and 24 7 prayer but i also see overall amazing apathy and indifference and lukewarmness in, in who are called christians and uh, i and again that's just part of what uh, paul warned about in thessalonians but then the second part is the world seduces the believers and you know the world takes over the, the Things of the world come into the church, and the church looks more like the world than 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 what the world being transformed by Christians and by their belief. We see the world seduces believers into becoming, and that's what uh, Mattathias uh, fought against. He wanted to stop the the Greek religion, the Greek beliefs, the Greek paganism from coming in to the Jewish people. The world demands conformity. Oh my goodness, are we not seeing that today? The world world demands conformity in every area of, uh, and now we, the whole thing with COVID and you know, vaccinations and all kinds of, you must believe the way the world believes. You must believe the way the government tells you. You must do what the government tells you. And if you don't, you will be isolated and you won't be able to uh, take part in certain activities. This is all just coming right before us at this time. There will come a time when persecution will begin, just like it was for Mattathias and the time of uh, the, uh, the Maccabees. Uh, persecution will take place. There will become persecution. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 24, we read Jesus says, then they will deliver you up to the tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now he's talking about the tribulation period here and then Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because, and then it goes on to say, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. And I end off with, there will be a test of faith. Um, we have to know what we believe we will be tested. And I just want to, you know, and again, the book of Revelation says, there is victory though, but how is the victory coming? In the book of Revelation, I love the verse 
verse uh, 11 of chapter 12, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And now very often we leave out the last part of this verse. We love to quote by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But the last part says, they did not love their lives to the death. And so I just want to close off with that and say, Thank you very much um, for this uh, rather lengthy teaching. But you know, it's so amazing. I, I just love, uh, you know, of course, I've been in the military. I just love the heart of the leadership, which they trusted totally in the Lord. They trusted in him and he came through for them. I believe he'll do the same for us in the future. We trusted him totally with all our heart. And, you know, don't let fear do not let fear and do not let deception those are the two ploys of the enemy being used ruthlessly at this time do not let them grip you and so I just say Lord and we just give this teaching to you be glorified in us help us to know our part help us to know what where how to act how to speak, and Lord, um, what to do. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to...